Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series I find greatly fascinating. It's a series about the great controversy which we've chosen to title Rebellion and Redemption. That sounds like a good progression. This is the lesson number 11 in that series for March 12 of 2016. I hope you have your Bible handy. We'll be looking mostly at the writings of Peter, his two short books. Uh, we maybe should mention in passing that Peter was probably also the person behind the writing of the Gospel of Mark, but we won't spend much time with Mark. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we rejoice in the truths as you have presented them in these lessons. We are so happy that the great controversy is, has been won, that it was won by Jesus, that Satan's arguments have been proven false, his accusations have been unfounded, and as a result of what you have done, what you did 2,000 years ago, we all can be winners if we choose seriously to join your side. May we see that represented in our lesson for this time as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What do you think Peter had to say about the great controversy? Um, he had those two short letters. He's the one who tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, from the New King James. Well, that ought to be some kind of a something about the great controversy, right? Well, in this series of lessons, the emphasis has been on the struggle on this earth between good and evil. Seventh-day Adventists who take Ellen White seriously know that the Great Controversy is much larger than that. It involves the entire universe. Remember that the Great Controversy began in heaven, not on this earth. You, you know the passage in Revelation 12, 7 through 12. Did any of the angels who remained loyal to God have questions in their minds about the issues involved? Yes. Absolutely. Do you think one third could be totally deceived and join Satan's side and the others be have no questions at all? That doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9 reminds us that our little world is the lesson book or theater of the universe. What does that imply? We're being watched. We're being watched. And what do you think the universe is learning from watching us? Is, are, they, are they watching us to see what saints we are? They we're on a stage telling the, how evil works and how God work, is involved in attempting to com communicate or educate his children. So what, what the really is, Dennis? Well, I sort of think they're watching God. Yeah, exactly. To see how he deals with this rebellion um, which which didn't start on this earth, no. but but started in heaven, mm -hmm. and and that that rebellion which started in heaven, which I believe is quarantined to this earth, mm -hmm. no. kept in a safe place, you know, so it it was Can't spread. It, that's right, um, gives reason, gives explanation for why this world was created for why we are here, what our responsibilities are. So how do people ignore all that and, and read Revelation 12? Well, what, what do they do with that? How, yeah. do they just, is it just a, a piece of the puzzle which falls off the table? Well, a lot of people aren't quite sure what to do with the whole book of Revelation. And, and, and let's be honest. The, the reason a lot of people have huge problems with the book of Revelation is because Revelation is full of prophecies. And if you don't believe that even God can predict the future, what do you do with Revelation? See, if you think the only, that whatever John wrote had to be about something that either happened in his day or something prior to his day, it can't possibly be prophetic in any way, then you've got a big problem. And that's where, unfortunately, a lot of scholars Bible scholars are in our day. 
Well, one of the most important texts in Peter's writings concerning the great controversy, very specifically, is 1 Peter 1, verse 12. I'm going to read from my Good News Bible. God revealed to these prophets, talking about the writers in the Old Testament, that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours. Now, he's talking to, who's he writing to? Who's Peter writing to? The exiles in the dispersion. Yeah, but the people in his day. Yeah. The, yeah. the Christians who are trying to live Christian lives and under very difficult circumstances in Peter's day. As they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. What does that mean? Even the, I mean, angels are standing next to God. They're beside the throne room, you know, at, in and out of the throne room of heaven. God is right there. They can ask him any question they want. Why are there things he don't, why are there things that they don't understand? Well, you want to put with Ephesians uh, 3, 9, and 10. And, We've uh, got them all listed there. 1 Corinthians 4, well, we already mentioned 1 Corinthians 4, 9, but for Ephesians, let's just look at a few verses. Let me just quote them from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. For it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, this is Paul writing now, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle, and the Greek word is theater, for the whole world of angels and of humanity. Who was mentioned first? Angels. Angels. <laughs> we are theater for the universe. Then we go to Ephesians 1, 8 to 10, which he gave us in such large measure, talking about God's gifts to us. And all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us, the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. How, how, how wide is that uh, net that he's talking about there? And Heaven these, and earth, right? These are the interpretations and the message that Paul has to bear. But and then in excuse me, John twelve thirty two, mm -hmm. Jesus says, "I, if I be lifted up, I will draw everyone or all to myself." We're going to look at that one in a moment. Going to Ephesians three, I am less than the least of all God's people. This is Paul talking. You all agree that he was less than the least of all God's people, right? Yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that, at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. By means of the church. They're going to learn about what? God's wisdom in all its different forms? How does that work? Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And then Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood. He brought peace to the entire universe through the death of his Son on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. I mean, I don't know how it could be stated much clearer than that, although I'll say Ellen White did a marvelous job. Let me, let, let, let me quote some passages from Ellen White. Yes. Can I ask one side question here? The first sentence of First Peter 1.12 that you had there, God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours. Mm -hmm. How... Where did Peter get that? I mean, I understand, yeah. I believe it, but how did I think Peter God, know that God had revealed to the prophets that it was for future generations? I, I think Peter got it from Jesus Christ. But it says God revealed to these prophets. Mm -hmm. so but, but, but you asked that, how, that how Peter. Ancient, well, how did Peter know that those old prophets I see. had gotten it? For, for future generations. Yeah. Because, because Peter spent the three and a half years with Jesus, and Jesus quoted those prophets about 250 times. I think they're 
unique quotations are uh, maybe in the uh, 50, 48 or 50. That we have recorded. That we have recorded in the Bible that Jesus, uh, Harold Coffin uh, gave me his notes. Uh, he studied that and worked that out, um, the late Dr. Coffin. Yeah. So now I'm going, to, I'm going to read to you a few passages, if you'll forgive me, from Ellen White that spell this out. She's just trying to expand what Peter said, what Paul said. Christ died for sinless angels too. Is this sinful angels or sinless angels? I mean, I, 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 just, I just feel obligated to ask. Okay. Yeah. If they were sinless, what, what payment would be required on, on, on their exactly. behalf? Exactly. Exactly. What sacrifice would be required? Well, here's what she says. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. That's a future. Will prevent? There was, had already been sin in heaven, mm -hmm. and there had already been sin on this earth. Yeah following what began in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. They learned something of great importance from watching the story, the life of Jesus Christ and his death here on this earth. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. So may I interrupt? Yes. So something has changed mm -hmm. that, that rebellion and sin could and did start in heaven. Yes. Okay. Um, if this were all to be wiped out and forgotten about and so forth, what would prevent sin or rebellion from recurring again? Nothing. Nothing. So and there would have been no reason for even to go through this whole experiment. If God didn't plan to preserve a record, there's no reason for, uh, he should have just eliminated Satan right up front. If, if we look at this whole situation, mm -hmm. something has changed. Yeah. God knew, we're told, she tells us, that God knew that Satan would rebel and that Adam would follow. Mm -hmm. But when we go talk uh, about Revelation again and a description of the new earth, mm -hmm. what do we learn? Mm -hmm. That sin, rebellion, will never recur, will never and occur again. We're going to talk about the reason for that in the rest of this quotation. Well, that's the question, is what's mm -hmm. changed between mm -hmm. creation and, and the new earth? And let me read the rest of this quotation, then I'll make a suggestion. Okay. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. You just pointed that out. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. The plan of salvation provides what? An eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's quoted by Ellen White. It was written by Ellen White, December 30, 1889, that's almost exactly one year after the 1888 General Conference. And it's quoted in a few rel relatively obscure places. Not widely quoted by Seventh-day Adventists, unfortunately. And I would say that the way that might work, let me just offer one possible suggestion. If a million years from now, for example, God makes a new world with a new group of people of some kind on that world, and one of them decides to rebel. Say, why do we have to do things God's way? I want to go do it my way, the selfish way. God can take that person, just tap him on the shoulder and say, sit down here, I want you to see what happened the last time someone tried this. And here's the, the whole history of the great controversy. They can see the whole thing from beginning to end. I'm sure there's going to be a, a 3D living video that will make Steven Spielberg turn green. You know, and, and let me just finish, if I may. If that person doesn't realize how foolish it is to go that route after watching that, the whole story of the Great Controversy, God could then say, okay, I want you to stand right there. 
gather all the rest of us around and say, this person wants, basically wants to start the great controversy all over again. What do you think I should do? And we would say simply, step back. Because when he separates from God, he's toast. I look at it as, suppose that person, that, that theoretical person, mm -hmm. um, were to try and accuse God of being untrustworthy, mm -hmm. uh, of, of being deceitful. Um, we can go back to the, the library or, or whatever it is and, and look there at what happened in Genesis 3. There's, uh, there's, there's Lucifer mm -hmm. accusing God of being a liar, mm -hmm. of not being trustworthy, of not acting in our, our own best interest. And what is different, what will be different in that situation than in Genesis, we have a whole lot of data, we have a whole lot of experience, which Eve, which Adam did not have, which the universe did not have. At that point. That's right. And we have this, this 6,000 years of experience, painful experience, mm -hmm. to look at. And uh, God can easily ask. You want to repeat that? Did the angels need, did the angels need the message of the cross? And if you say yes, I'm going to say why. And here's Ellen White's comment to that. For centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors. At his holy law prostrate, despised, trampled underfoot, he swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood. But when the earth was again peopled, men drew away from God and renewed their hostility to him. Manifesting bold defiance, those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage followed in the footsteps of those who had preceded them. So we all know where we are in history now, right? Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. A crisis had arrived where? In the government of God. We're not talking about down in Egypt or even in Palestine. A crisis had arrived in the government of God. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth filling it with fire and flame. And of course, guess what would happen to us? God had but to speak and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. The heavenly intelligence were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. I mean, they had already seen the flood, right? Now, why is God tolerating all this evil again? Look what he did last time. Why doesn't he just do it again? Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected the angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love to save fallen humanity. The Son of God took humanity upon himself. Review and Herald, July 17, 1900. Not quoted anywhere else for some reason. Let's try it another place. With intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah rise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. That's what they expected. They, God, are you a God of justice? Do something about, I mean, why are you tolerating all this wickedness? And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing to himself the legions of heavenly beings. You can just see him waiting there and licking his chops. He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness impossible. Had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusations were proved true. He was ready to cast blame upon God and to spread his rebellion to the worlds above. But instead of destroying the world, God sent his son to save it. Desire of Ages 37, paragraph 2. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many times we have to repeat this, but why do so few people know about these past, this idea? I have a question. Yeah. If the angels needed a representation of God's uh, character, and it says here in that last quote you read, the angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Mm -hmm. How did their view of God get so skewed in heaven that they were actually looking for God? You suppose someone's been telling lies about God up there somewhere? I'd imagine so. <laughs> I, I, I suspect it was a lot of this bad seed was sowed by Satan. Lucifer when he was still there. And they, you know, they, 
they were saying, uh, you know, we trust God, but maybe Lucifer was at least partly right. This reminds me of the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. Lucifer is here. If God does that, I've got him. If he does that, I've got him. Mm -hmm. you know, and yet, <laughs> Jesus. yet God did something different. And he, oh. I hadn't oh. thought about that. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing how Jesus always got out of those impossible traps. Well, again, do we dare to go on? This is um, Manuscript 22, January 10, 1890, from her personal diary. It's found only in L. G. White 1888 materials, 569 and 570. For centuries, God bore with the inhabitants of the old world, but last guilt reached its limit. He came out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, and by a flood, cleanse the earth of its iniquity. So, had the angels seen God do that once? They had, right? Notwithstanding this terrible lesson, men had no sooner begun to multiply once more than rebellion and vice became widespread. Uh, how many of you write this kind of stuff in your diary? Yeah. Satan seemed to, and, and I'm, let, let's just, just talk about that for a moment. Ellen White had an extensive diary, bunch of diaries. And what would happen is she would get visions in the middle of the night and God would tell her, you know, probably is not the right time to, to tell anybody about this right now. She would write it down in her diary. That's how we get this kind of stuff. Satan seemed to have taken control of the world. What's he called? The prince of this world, right? The time came that a change must be made or the image of God would be wholly obliterated from the hearts of the beings he had created. You've got to do something, right? All heaven watched the movements of God with intense interest. Would he once more manifest his wrath? Now, this is not talking about the flood. This is talking about later times. They said, he must, he's, it's, things are so bad, he's got to do it again. Would he destroy the world by fire? The angels thought that the time had come to strike the blow of justice when, lo, to their wondering vision was unveiled the plan of salvation. Amazing. And one more, after the fall of our first parents, Christ declared that in order to save man from the penalty of sin, he would come to the world to conquer Satan on the enemy's own battlefield. The controversy that began in heaven was to be continued on the earth. In this controversy, much was to be involved. Vast interests were at stake before the inhabitants of the heavenly universe were to be answered the questions, is God's law perfect in need of amendment or abrogation or is it immutable? Is God, I'm sorry, is God's law imperfect in need of am, am, amend, amendment or abrogation, or is it immutable? Is God's government in need of change, or is it stable? Before Christ's first advent, the sin of refusing to conform to God's law had become widespread. Apparently, Satan's power was growing. His warfare against heaven was becoming more and more determined. A crisis had been reached. Within, with an intense interest, God's movements were watched by the heavenly angels. Would he come forth from his place and punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity? Would he send fire or flood to destroy them? All heaven, this is not talking about Satan and his angels, all heaven waited the bidding of their commander to pour out the vials of wrath upon a rebellious world. What are they waiting to do here? Destroy our world, destroy right? There's a bunch of rebels, God. Just get rid of them. One word from him, one sign, and the world would have been destroyed. How much of the world? It's like all of it, right? The world's unfallen would have said, Amen, thou art righteous, O God, because thou hast exterminated rebellion. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God might have sent his son to condemn, but he sent him to save. Christ came as a redeemer. No words can describe the effect of this movement on the heavenly angels. With wonder and admiration, they could only exclaim, Herein is love. Signs of the Times, August 27, 1902. Now, I hope you will forgive me for reading, for reading several passages here from uh, Ellen White. To, but just to expound on 1 Peter 1, verse 12. But I think it's essential for us to understand that 
the rest of the universe is involved in the great conflict just as much as we are. The angels want, several times thought that God should have destroyed our entire world, but he didn't. Is that true? I know it's true for the angels, the unfallen angels, but is that also true for all the other beings in the universe that aren't in well, heaven? We, we, don't, we don't have words about that. Uh, about that. I, I don't know why it wouldn't be true. I would think they would have been exposed to the same arguments and issues and questions in their minds that, that the heavenly angels were exposed to. Yeah. But here's the genius of mm. God's solution, yeah. is that he eradicates sin, he eradicates rebellion in such a way that it can't happen again. Yeah. Not because of there's a, a loss of freedom, but it would be crazy, it would be stupid to repeat what we've experienced in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you answer the questions, the serious questions that the angels have in heaven? Demonstration. Has to be demonstrated. This is not a time for just saying, well, I'm like this, I'm, I do this and this and this, and you better believe me, right? Because Satan would stand up and say, well, no, God's wrong. I'm this, 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 and this, and you better believe me. And then what are you going to do? Yeah. One of the most important considerations when thinking about the great controversy is the fact that it will come to an end just after the third coming of Jesus Christ. However, apparently Peter knew nothing of the millennium or the third coming. It is only through John's writings and Revelation that we learn about the millennium and the third coming. Meanwhile, Peter looked forward to Christ's second coming. If Christ is not coming back, there was really no reason for him to come the first time. So Peter dealt with those who scoff and mock, actually turning them into one of the signs of the nearness of the second coming in 2 Peter 3, 3 to 7. So why did I say the, the, the great controversy will come to an end at the third coming? What will bring it to an end? Every knee will bow. Every yeah. knee will bow. Philippians 2, 8 to 10. That Every knee will bow. Presumably that includes Lucifer slash Satan mm -hmm. and all the angels and all the wicked. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is something that I think very few people seem to comprehend. And I just hope that we're making it as clear as we can here. God is not going to allow even the wicked to perish until they have seen the truth about him. They will see that panorama all the way across the sky just after Jesus is crowned high up in the heavens and the, 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 the forces of Satan are surrounding this, the New Jerusalem and they think, we're going we're gonna to conquer this city, we're going to get in there, we're going to get to the tree of life and we're going to live forever. And all of a sudden there is this panorama and they're just no, there's nothing else to say. And when it's done, they're on their knees. Because the, the case is so compelling that there's no other response possible, even from Satan himself. So, and when, yet they're not converted. Yeah, not converted. They're not changed. No. They continue with the same personality and uh, attitudes and behaviors as before. And the, the, the scriptures seem to suggest that uh, they're going to be so angry about what happened is they're going, to, they're going to kill each other, among other things. I mean, you know. Well, coming back to Peter, we haven't spent a lot of time with Peter yet. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. Look at this passage. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy. Where did Peter get those ideas? Numbers, wasn't it? No, well, but you're getting close. Exodus and Deuteronomy. Exodus 19. Yeah. And, and, and some part of it is in Deuteronomy, or you're going to also as well. But Exodus 19, 6 and Deuteronomy 7, 6 is almost an exact quote from those places. Basically, Peter is saying the promises God made 
to the Jews in ancient times, they have failed to accept and to be, to be to take advantage of those promises. Now, God is extending those promises to all Christians. And you are, you're, you're a chosen nation. Everyone at this table and everyone watching, you have a, the privilege, the potential privilege of being one of God's chosen people. Well, it's interesting that in that context, in, if you read the King James, it says peculiar, his peculiar treasure. What does that mean? You like, everybody, everybody here want to be peculiar? Different? <coughs> I mean different? Okay, well that's part of the answer. Unique? Yeah, unique. peculiar in this, in the older meaning, it was unique, special. Singular. It means a special treasure, one especially appreciated. So, it is thus that every sinner may come to Christ, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, not, but according to his mercy he saved us, Titus 3, 5. When Satan tells you that you are a sinner and cannot hope to receive blessing from God, tell him that Christ came into the world to save sinners. We have nothing to recommend us to God, but the plea that we may urge now and ever is our utterly helpless condition that makes his redeeming power a necessity. Renouncing all self-dependency, we may look to the cross of Calvary and say, In my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Desire of Ages 317, paragraph 1. Well, it is absolutely essential that we recognize our need of Christ. And there are a couple of ways, there are several ways of looking at that. Um, to many of our Christian friends, that means... If Jesus hadn't died and paid the price, we wouldn't, none of us would have any hope. I would suggest that there's a much bigger meaning. If we didn't have the life of Jesus and his death to look to for the answers in the great controversy, there would be no hope of our being saved. That's a very different picture. Um, we need to understand the questions that he answered in the great controversy and the accusations against God that he refuted. We need to look to his life and death every day to realize exactly what they should and can mean to each of us. No wonder Ellen White said in Desire of Ages 83, paragraph 4, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour thinking about the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Hmm. Well, let's pick another part of first of Peter. 1 Peter 4, 1-7 Since Christ suffered physically, you too must strengthen yourselves with the same way of thinking. Hold on here. My screen is jumping around here. Um, that he had. Because whoever suffers physically is no longer involved with sin. Now how, how does that work? What does it mean, he who suffers physically is no longer involved with sin? Have anybody? Well, let me read on. From now on, then, you must live the rest of your earthly lives controlled by God's will and not by human desires. You have spent enough time in the past doing what the heathen like to do. Your lives were spent in indecency, lust, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and the disgusting worship of idols. I wonder how well that would describe Hollywood. Hmm. Well, anyway. And now the heathen are surprised when you do not join them in the same wild and reckless living, and so they insult you. But they will have to give an account of themselves to God who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached also to the dead. Now that's preached also to the dead. What does that mean? It's my understanding it means uh, those people who have already died. Yeah. It was preached to them while they were still alive. Right. Yeah. That is why the good news was preached also to the dead, to those who had been judged in their physical existence as everyone is judged. It was preached to them so that in their spiritual existence they may live as God lives. The end of all things is near. You must be self-controlled and alert to be able to pray. Well, Peter recognized that Christians to whom he was writing had come out of lives filled with indecency, lust, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, 
and the disgusting worship of idols, as we read there in verse 3. To come, up, to come out of that environment and live a truly Christian, upright life in cooperation with Jesus Christ would certainly make one seem to be strange, right? I mean, if you go as a faithful Christian and you go to some of the more, the wilder parties that go on around here and elsewhere in the world, um, do you stick out like a sore thumb? People wonder why you're there, right? But we must learn to stand up against the crowd. If we cannot withstand peer pressure, we are essentially lost. How do I know that? Remember what it says in Matthew 24, 24? Anybody offhand? For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. So who's going to survive that? Not many, right? That's right. In response, Peter reminded us that, like us, those so-called Gentiles will appear before the judgment seat of God. Everybody, the people who go to the parties, the people who drink drunken and all this kind of stuff, doesn't matter what your situation is, sooner or later, you will stand before the judgment seat of God. Every one of us. Peer pressure is especially important to teenagers. But adults are not free from it at all. So instead of thinking of ourselves as somehow strange, we need to remember 1 Peter 4, 8 and 9. Let's look at that for a moment. Above everything, love one another earnestly because love covers over many sins. Open your homes to each other without complaining. So what is Peter thinking about? He's probably thinking about that early church experience, right? When they shared everything there in Jerusalem. If we treat even strangers with kindness and love, we will stand out from the crowd, not in a way that makes us seem queer or strange, but in a wonderful way that will attract others to us. And what verses can you think of that would support that idea? Matthew five thirteen to 16, I think. Yes, especially 16. Let your good works be seen. Let your light so shine that people may see what you're doing and glorify you and your church. Your Father. No, glorify your Father who is in heaven. And what about John 13, 34 and 35? Let's look at that for a second just to, to see how that might support what we're talking about here. John 13. 30, we'll start with 34. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, okay, he's talking to a bunch of disciples, right? Who are, who are arguing and fighting over who's going to be the prime minister. <laughs> he says, if you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. How is that possible? What does that tell you about everybody else? Great contrast between them and mm. it, it, if you really godlike as Jesus was, you stick out like a sore thumb. Well, let's ask a couple more questions. How often do you do what you do because you want to be accepted by others in your community as opposed to being a faithful child of God? In your daily activities, think about it. Right now, am I doing this because I want other people to like me, I want to be accepted by my peers, or because it's what God wants me to be doing right now? That's a pretty stiff standard, right? You're referring to Kohlberg's uh, stages or levels there? It would be appropriate to think about them. Why was it that ancient Israel was so influenced by the pagan peoples and religions around them instead of influencing those people for the good? Now I want you to think about this for a moment. Think of all the trouble God went to to take his children out of Egypt all the way across the desert, feeding them for 40 years with manna, taking care of all their animals, etc. However he did that, I don't know. And finally gets the idea is to get him into the land of Palestine so they can do what? 
that their shine, their light shine before the whole universe. Now, I absolutely believe that God knew from the beginning what was going to be the result of all that. And from a human perspective, you might say what? Then why do it? Why did you bother? Why did you bother? What did you accomplish by all of that? So why do you think the ancient Israelites were so affected, so attracted by these pagan religions around them? Well, I would think it would be an obvious um, jealousy or, I don't know, another word for it, that they had something, they were prospering somehow or another, whatever they were doing, maybe we should try that too. Okay. Do you think anyone ever asked, okay, you worship this fertility cult God, fertility cult God, and I worship Yahweh. Let me plant my plants here, you, my, my field here, and you plant your field here. Let's see who does the best. I mean, that would be a modern way of trying yeah. to check. But of course, they never, I'm sure they never even thought like that. The scientific but, method didn't develop, you know, until yeah. four or five hundred years ago. Yeah. There had to be something but surely somebody they thought must. was better. Yeah. I, I mean. Or maybe they just thought it was more fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's possible. Yeah. Well, Peter goes on to say, this is 1 Peter 1, verses 16 to 21. We have not depended on made-up stories and making known to you the mighty coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we have told you the truth about the life and death of Jesus, right? With our own eyes, we saw his greatness. We were there when he was given honor and glory by God the Father when the voice came to him from the supreme glory, saying, This is my own dear Son with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What's he talking about? Actually, this is Second Peter. I think I said First Peter. Second Peter. Mount of Transfiguration. The Mount of Transfiguration. So, and I, I have to be honest in saying that many, many so-called scholars look at the prophecies and so forth in Second Peter and they say, well, there's no way that could have been written by Peter. This is, it must have been written several hundred years later, maybe by somebody else. How did it get in the Bible? We're not sure. So sad. Well, Peter, right here in that book, says, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. We're reading on verses 19 to 21. So we are even more confident on the message proclaimed by the prophets. Remember a little while ago we were talking about how he knew about why the prophets, their message was for us, etc. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in their hearts. What was Miller studying that led to the great Adventist awakening? What part of the Bible? Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. That's in the Old Testament. William Miller. Going on, above all else, I remember that no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. What, what kind of picture does he have of inspiration? Pretty high picture, right? It is God's idea, God's thoughts expressed in human language maybe dimmed down a little because we don't have the language of heaven to do, explain it in. But there are lots of questions that have been raised about biblical authors. How do they get their messages? Can we be certain that their messages actually came from God? What did they see or hear that influenced their writings? Peter left no doubt about the fact that he saw Jesus Christ himself. He saw him receive glory from God the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he was even more certain about the prophecies from the prophets. As an example regarding biblical authorship, Peter himself proclaimed for no, and there's our verse, for no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God, right? 
Well, what else do we know about Peter and his understanding of the great controversy? What happened at the end of his, near the end of his experience with Jesus? You remember in the court of the home of, the, of Annas, the high priest? Jesus was being tried and being condemned. What was Peter doing? Peter said, I don't know him. Denying him. Three times he said that. Wow. I'm sure after when he realized what he, what he had done, he went out. Ellen White says he went out, out of there just weeping and crying. He ran. He didn't even know where he was going and he ended up falling down on the very spot in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus had prayed. Well, Peter makes a, has a suggestion about how we deal with those issues found in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 8. For this very reason, do your best to add goodness to your faith, to your goodness add knowledge, to your knowledge add self-control, to your self-control add endurance, to your endurance add godliness, to your godliness add Christian, add Christian affection, and to your Christian affection add love. These are the qualities that you need, and if you have them in abundance, they will make you active and effective in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his suggestion. Uh, where do those kind of things come from? Those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those are related, at least, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't get those things just, you know, down at the store or some... Even, even from our parents, naturally, they come from the Holy Spirit. Certainly not human nature. No, not natural for human beings. Well, then we come to Second Peter 3, and in the last part of our lesson, I think we really need to focus on this. What does Second Peter 3 say? Well, let's look at that passage. We probably should really start with, with the first verse. My dear friends, this is how the second letter I have, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I have tried to arouse pure thoughts in your minds by reminding you of these things. I want you to remember the words that were spoken long ago by the holy prophets. There was now, this is the third time we've already mentioned. He's talking about the words spoken long ago by the holy prophets and the command that the Lord and Savior which was given to you, and the command from the Lord and Savior which was given to you by your apostles. Now, he would be one of those apostles, wouldn't he? First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, He promised to come, didn't He? Where is He? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water, the water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. So what's he saying here? Things have not always been the same. God has the power to create a world, and he has the power to destroy the world, right? But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. And then he goes on, but do not forget one thing. My dear friends, there is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him the two are the same. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. And then this incredible passage that raises all kinds of questions in the eyes of biblical, so-called biblical scholars. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. The earth and with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. What does that mean? The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. Do we have anything to do with the timing of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Ellen White certainly suggested that we do. 
or at least that people in her time did, and I'm sure that extends to us. We believe that the great controversy, the cosmic conflict, is coming to an end. The devil is scared to death, so he goes about as a hungry, roaring lion looking for his next meal. Peter made it clear that the mockers, the scoffers, and even the devil himself are doing what they are doing because they want things to continue as they have always been. They even present what they believe are unanswerable arguments in favor of their views. I can't forget a few, not too long ago, it was maybe two, three years ago now, there was a cover on the National Geographic magazine. I love the pictures in National Geographic, but some of their, some of their theories are just incredible. And the idea was, and I don't remember the exact wording, but that was, could Charles Darwin have been wrong? And the answer, no! You know, what are we trying to say? Well, Peter tells us that those kind of people are just another sign that the second coming is near. Such people, of course, deny that God destroyed the world by a flood because they certainly do not want to believe that God might do the same thing again. So, what do we know about the day of God, the day of the Lord in the Bible? Remember, having read that somewhere, the day of the Lord. What is that? Joel talked about it. Joel Daniel 2 talks, talks about it. way back, way, way back in the Old Testament. He talks about it. Yeah? Anything else? The day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Yeah? It's He's not two. talking about, and if you read on, it's talking about it, all the signs that we talk about as the signs of the the final events of this earth's history, they're right there in Joel. Yep. Earthquakes, heavens tremble, sun and moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Daniel talks about other people. So the day, in ancient Hebrew thinking, the day of the Lord was a time when everything would, be, would come crashing down and then God will remake everything new. So you... Many of our Christian friends have the idea that things are going to get better and better. Jesus, and there's, then there's a, some variations about exactly how it's going to end. But Jesus may come down to this earth. He may rule here on this earth for a period of time to what some, some people call the millennium of the golden age. And then God himself comes down and, 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 and that's, that's, that's where we end up. Is that what you see happening in our world? Obviously, everybody's getting better and better and obeying the Word of God. And Not really. Not really. <laughs> but what about us? Do we act as if Jesus is coming again soon? Do our neighbors and work associates recognize that we're different? I, I, I'm very hesitant to use myself as an example, but I will, I will venture this. I work with a lot of, I'm a physician, for those of you who haven't heard me say that before. And I worked at a clinic, which I helped to start more than 20 years ago. And it's a, it's a clinic where we serve the underserved populations. And in order to be as, as friendly as possible, we have employed a lot of people with relatively minimal training. We're talking about medical assistants, LBNs, and they have to be bilingual and they have to be from among the people that we serve. So that people feel, the people who come in will feel very comfortable in, 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 in dealing with them. And I have, since way back in the early years of, my, of, the, of that experience, I have felt that, you know, the, 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 my peers, they, they, can, they can handle their problems. They're doing fine. But I, I, I try to associate... I try to make a very special effort to associate with the people who, and I, I, you know, I try to be nice to them at Christmas time and so forth like this. Well, it gets embarrassing because when Christmas time is just Christmas time is about here now. I'm now obviously we're recording way ahead these lessons, and I have Christmas gifts piled on my desk, and I'm the only one who has Christmas gifts piled on your desk. Now, is that because people see something different? in the way I behave? I think they do. I think they do. 
God is waiting for people who are ready to stand up and be blameless as Job was. The Bible talks about God is looking for faultless people. 2 Peter 3, 4 talks about what we just read a little bit ago about the, the critics. As time passed on, Ellen White says, with no apparent change in nature, men whose hearts had at times trembled with fear, this is talking about the days of Noah, began to be reassured. They reasoned, as many reason now, that nature is above the God of nature and that her laws are so firmly established that God himself could not change them. Reasoning that if the message of Noah were correct, nature would be turned out of her course. They made that message in the minds of the world a delusion, a grand deception. They manifested their contempt for the warning of God by doing just as they had done before the warning was given. They asserted that if they were the, there were any truth in what Noah had said, the men of renown, the wise, the prudent, the great men would understand the matter. And what was the result? They were all destroyed, right? Well, Peter had spent three and a half years, a great part of those three and a half years with Jesus Christ. And he learned a lot of things from him. By looking at the writings by Peter and the over, overall message of the New Testament, does it look to you like the life of the Christian is going to become easier and easier as we approach the end? Doesn't look like it to me. Will Satan's final efforts to deceive and destroy reach a crescendo? I think so. How, you, would you, how will you respond if you are imprisoned or tortured or threatened or questioned about your faith? In the book of Revelation, the saints follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And where did the Lamb go? To the cross. To the cross. Will we stand firm when there comes physical torture, slander, ridicule, even disdain? How good are we at being, standing up and even proudly on God's side, even though we're recognized as being different? Well... There's more that we could say. We've talked about being peculiar. Does keeping God's commandments identify us? Do you hide the fact that you're a Seventh Advent and people ask you who you are and what you believe? That's not the way we stand up for God's side. I hope that in, these, in this lesson, this hour we've spent together, you've recognized that the entire universe is involved in, a, in an effort which is absolutely essential and you can be a part of it too. Our kind and wonderful Father, thank you for these revealing words from your friends, ancient and modern, that lead us to respect you even more, to recognize the challenges that you have faced and the challenges you are still facing and trying to deal with a rebellious world. We know that if it were your will, if that was all that was involved, you would save all of us. But you cannot compromise freedom to save sinners. And so you have to allow us to make our own choices. And so many of us, unfortunately, will make wrong choices. Help those of us who are listening today to make a right choice and to become a part of your children and be so forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.